This next panel takes on the explosive topic of AI models and trust. It frankly should be titled, I get by with a little help my, from my friends, because the panel um, is a huge number of people, both uh, virtual as well as here in person. We're gonna take you on a journey and give you concrete examples of how trust for IoT systems differs and is exponentially more complex than when compared to traditional enterprise systems. They'll explore how generative AI relates to current digital access management and trust methods, and how to improve the outlook for trust protocols for IoT interactions, transactions. Okay, get ready, strap in for this next session, and I'm gonna to introduce to the stage the panelist and David Marr, the EVP and CTO of InterTrust, who's gonna lead this panel, if they're ready. There you go, David. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Dave Mayer, the CTO of InterTrust, and I specialize in trust management for distributed systems. I'm currently working on what we just heard about, the uh, trust model for the newly born trusted energy uh, interoperability and al uh, uh, alliance. And uh, I'd like to introduce our panel. Actually, uh, I don't like introducing people because sometimes I classify them. And these guys are all polymaths. I mean, they're, they, so I'd rather you know, perhaps you take, take a moment to introduce yourself. Diana? Sure, uh, Diana Rothfuss. I'm the principal product uh, marketer for our fraud and financial crime solutions here at SAS. Um, I basically work with our financial institutions, but obviously on the payment side, it's grown far beyond that. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Hello there, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Ted Delavecchi. I'm CEO and founder of Symbotics. Uh, we digitally enable advancements in healthcare and in the ESG sustainability space. It's a pleasure to be here, and again, thanks for participating. Hey everyone, I'm Justin Ferguson. Um, for those who uh, didn't join the other panel, uh, I am a product manager for uh, AI machine learning, uh, focusing on solution integration, which again means uh, I make sure our products are talking together appropriately. Uh, and I also um, I sit on the Trustworthy AI uh, Task Force here at SAS. George? Yeah, hi, I'm George Young. I'm the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for CB Technologies, and we specialize in um, integration, system integration, uh, specifically in the IT OT space um, of, um, of the networking and cybersecurity world. And just, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Corey? Yep, uh, Corey Lechkowski. I am a technical sales specialist with Red Hat. I currently <clears throat> focus on edge uh, products and also uh, data science. And uh, glad to be here, excited to talk today, thanks. Cool, so um, one of the themes here is, uh, we uh, heard about uh, trust models earlier and uh, earlier in the day uh, also for uh, AI, and, and we're gonna go over a little bit more of that today. Uh, but uh, the trust model for IoT uh, is a fraught topic, and, it, and we know that the model needs to be different than the trust model for the internet, which is pretty simple, actually. Uh, trust assurances on the internet are principally provided by something called trans, uh, transport layer security, or TLS, sometimes denoted by the little lock on, the, uh, uh, on your web browser when you are actually using the uh, TLS protocol, and uh, a public key infrastructure. And what that basically does is it assures uh, trusted paths between users of the internet or users of websites and things of that sort, and the organizations identi identified by URLs. And that enables a, um, a human-driven, principally, per uh, uh, purchases and payments over the internet. Uh, that's pretty much it. There is the concept of things like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, VPNs, virtual private networks, and things of that sort, but they, private networks are, in fact, private networks or overlays. And what we're talking about with IoT is still a public internet. 
uh, but it's uh, got to have a different trust model. Uh, so uh, in the IoT is much more about interactions and uh, among heterogeneous devices and automated processes. And the automation uh, increasingly involves the involvement of not of just humans, but, but AI-driven uh, decisions. And uh, those uh, trust models that we're trying to develop at this point needs to assure the authenticity of the data and the authority of commands and uh, action requests that are signaled across the internet. And uh, the problem is that the devices are making decisions based on policies that refer to the events that are supposed to be authoritative and authentic. And on models that have been trained on information that we understand is tr and is transparent. There was a great um, panel earlier about transparency, but you know, we're still talking about information that's sourced over the internet. Uh, so that's why the IoT needs a trust model where the information observed and fed into it is authentic and authoritative. And that's just not provided today on the internet. Uh, and uh, so the question is, how do we get there? So let's begin with the, uh, the big uh, picture, the, the sort of the big data picture, if you will. AI as sort of augmented uh, in intelligence allows us to gather a lot of information and um, widely distributed uh, about events and make sense of it and uh, use it in real time. So Diana, you look at that real picture, mm -hmm. at that big picture, and how can we both see and use all of that information carefully and feed the new uh, AI decision makers with the best information possible to make those best decisions? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, right at the helm of all of this, you can think that you have the best data until you don't. So data management, um, knowing where you're working with, especially knowing where it comes from in the um, you know, IoT space, it's, it's very key. And I think what goes behind that is a very strong orchestration platform. So if you can have that in your organization, um, a strong one, the one that can make trusted decisions, one that can make fast decisions, but also ones that we know that are accurate and can really provide a robust picture of not only who your customer is, but you know if you look at it from a fraud perspective, who is not your customer, um, it can really help just glean insights as to you know what you're looking for. So I think really making sure that organizations have an orchestration platform that can see across the enterprise and bring together all those, you know, I'll call them data silos, right? You know, I'll, we talk a lot about breaking down silos, making sure everything kind of flows in, and that's where that orchestration hub is key because it'll pull data from all these different sources. That's where you can match your data up against each other. Make sure that you're making the best informed decisions with your models and AI, and then when you come to authenticating somebody or making sure their loan application goes through, or frankly, just letting them log into their system. Um, it becomes really key and you know, really keeping that customer experience. So let's, let's consider one aspect of the decision makers that I just mentioned to that are getting all of this data. Uh, and um, I asked Bard, which is, as most of you probably know, is one of Google's uh, GPTs, why should we trust machines to make decisions for us? And the first part of the response from Bard was kind of interesting. Quote, machines are not biased. Humans are all biased in some way, whether it is due to our personal experiences, our upbringing, or our culture. Machines, on the other hand, are not biased. They can make decisions based on pure data without any emotional or personal baggage. And I thought to myself, really? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's what Bard said. So I, I followed up and I said, can AI models be badly influenced by bad or malicious training data? And Bard had the right answer there, yes. <laughs> AI models can be badly influenced by bad or malicious training data. This is because AI models learn from the data they are trained in. If the training data is biased, inaccurate, or malicious, the AI model will learn those biases and inaccuracies. 
this can learn to the AI mo model making bad decisions or producing harmful outputs. So Corey, you work on developer tools. How do we assure that the AI mechanisms are properly trained and, and that uh, the inputs used in the development are unbiased and or at least transparent? The software supply chain, as we know, is an important part of the IoT uh, AI trust model. Yeah, um, let me, yeah, I'll share a few insights there that, that I discussed with a few colleagues as well about this. Um, so for just a level set, so because this topic is about trust, trust is gained by meeting expectations over time. And uh, maybe that's a little too generalized, but we already have precedents around trust. Uh, for example, autonomous driving. We even have a legal precedence. If any of you have helped a teenager get a driver's license, you've seen the legal precedence of autonomous driving. <laughs> However, that's not with AI. And so talking more about how AI works, some of those things like computers don't have those emotions that are not as complex in that way. However, machine learning is based on humans. If humans don't exist, we can't train models. And if we don't have data from humans, we can't train models. Um, we, we as humans generate data. And if that data is biased because we are, then the model is biased too. Um, in the in software supply chain, so there's three things I'd like to focus on. One is data supply chain. So with IoT, you have data sources coming from everywhere. Um, one example that where, where there's a risk is so someone takes a $20 IoT device and steals it because it's physically easy to take. That's not as much of a risk as someone injecting data. They get that device and get some secret keys off of it and then inject false data into a trained model. So that's the data supply chain. We need to make sure that that's secure, that we can explain why certain things happen. Um, then there's their software supply chain. So for example, let's say you have a binary machine learning model that identifies hostile versus friendly uh, identities on, a, on an image. What if the model itself is inferencing correctly, however, the software flips that and, and flips hostile versus friendly, the model's still functioning well, but the software may have had a bug or was altered. Um, so again, like there's multiple supply chains and multiple trusts in developing this. And so with machine learning, it's very expensive. The other thing here, talking about trust in software is it's very easy to lose trust if there's an incident. And so we have to consider that as well with machine learning, just like humans. Uh, if we make a mistake in driving, our insurance rates go up. The same thing will happen with machine learning if it makes a mistake and we can't explain it. If it's our fault or it's, you know, defining whose fault it is will define how much trust we have in it. Cool. So let's go back um, to the uh, vastly uh, distributed de and decentralized nature of IoT uh, and the complex arrangements of the entities that are involved in a system. How do they learn to trust one another? Um, it, it's not just a client server model like, like we were t talking about before. How do different IoT entities acquire credentials uh, or, uh, or at least proxies for those c credentials that other entities can rely on. Do we expect AI en entities to have credentials, for, as an example? Ted, you've been thinking a lot about this. What do, what do you think? Yeah, thanks, Dave, and uh, good comments here. So we are obviously experiencing a vortex, if you will, of change, right, with regards to corporate business models, operating models, uh, IT architectures, and even uh, global social interactions, right? The, the dominant model today is still, although rapidly changing, uh, a centralized model, right? Where you kind of, for example, with regards to identity, your uh, email or your identity is ted at a domain dot x, right? Uh, and there's a password associated with that. And that password is centralized somewhere. Uh, first and foremost, just to point out a little soapbox issue here, um, you know, if that organization that the domain dot x right, decides they don't want TED anymore for some reason, uh, they can delete that address and my identity uh, in the digital world is gone. Right? Of course, I'm oversimplifying it, but think about that. Right? You are sovereign to others with regards to digital identity. Uh, but with regards to the decentralization movement that's occurring, I mean, think about it, the, 
you know, the channels of distribution have been effectively democratized by the evolution of technology. You've got massively parallel GPUs the size of your palm. You know, you've got uh, networked, uh, you know, uh, autonomous a agents of AI operating and doing stuff, actually even influencing outcomes, healthcare, manufacturing, et cetera. You know, uh, how does the current situation uh, evolve with regards to level of complexity when you're talking about exponentially networked nodes of computation as opposed to that being centralized, right? So the complexity, again, is on a scale uh, exponentially uh, increased, right? So you take the complexity, you add on top of it the current theft and fraud that happens today in today's identity identification model, and you've got a problem. And on top of that, the uh, availability, the open availability of uh, generative AI, chat GPT, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, now anyone, right, the barriers to entry, if you will, to becoming a hacker, a sophisticated hacker, not just someone banging away at a password, uh, a sophisticated, you could become a sophisticated hacker in a day if you know, if you have a computer and you know a little bit about, you know, accessing software, accessing, not writing, accessing software. So we need a new model. We're going to go into that. I'm not going to use it during my opening comments, but I hope we're going to go into you know, decentralized identity, often uh, referred to as self-sovereign identity, uh, what that means and how we might be able to adopt that. Finally, again, just a little plug for what's going on here. We're all together for the next two days. Uh, the reason uh, we think the flourishing, the growth of the IoT community, there are 45,000 plus members today and growing every day, um, is because there are organizations and people that are seeking answers and blueprints and models for best practices, or I should say next practices in the future. So join us, learn more, and inform us as well, because we don't know everything, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ted. Um, now, beyond accountability for these AI models, um, knowing and understanding how to use them is also important. Um, without that, there's no uh, real possibility, there is a real possibility of degrading trust. Uh, I'd like to bring up an antidote before I ask uh, George about this. And uh, recently, and I think many of you probably heard about this, the, Stephen Schwartz, uh, an attorney, asked ChatGPT to write a brief for a uh, case he was working on. And, um, and so ChatGPT did. It's, now available for all of us to use, and it included legal citations, uh, that is case law. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Schwartz actually used this and submitted it to the court, uh, and it turned out those citations were not real, um, and, um, but they were actually what uh, the AI folks call chat GPT hallucinations. Uh, they were made up, uh, and this was all caught by the court and his, his opponents, lawyers, who could not find the cases that were cited. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that Schwartz had asked ChatGPT, uh, are these cases real? The, you know, where can I, can I find them? And ChatGPT said, oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're real, and you can find them on Westlaw and Lexis. Unfortunately, that attorney didn't follow up and, and check. The fact is that uh, ChatGPT was just flat out lying, uh, and uh, like a kid would have been caught. So there were two problems here. First is the improper use of the AI agent to begin with, uh, and that was unforgivable, and this attorney is being called out in the carpet for this. And then there's the fact that Bard just Actually, it wasn't Chat uh, GPT. It was uh, Bard. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was Chat GPT. Was asking. So, uh, so in this case, uh, you know, we've got those two problems of uh, you just couldn't rely on this particular model in this particular case because BARD and ChatGPT, for that matter, are trained on the internet, which is a cesspool of disinformation, among <laughs> other things. Uh, so, uh, George, how do we deal with this and, uh, kind of thing in our IoT world? Yeah. Hey. Thanks, David. Yeah. Some of the, the way I, the way I, I kind of took a step back and I said, um, what if we didn't put any um, safety bumpers in place? I mean, what would happen, right? From the from the early stages, as as most cybersecurity people would know, it's uh, you know, if you develop a product or pro program, uh, you, you want to make sure that uh, it's safe and secure from the very beginning when you start doing some of the coding. So some of the things that uh, 
much, I was really interested in like, okay, what if we just let it be what it is right now, right? No regulations, nothing, and um, no safeguards. Well, basically what I've come, come up with in, in the research that I've come up, there's about four or five different things that kind of really stand out. And one of them is uh, harm to individuals in society. And that's, you know, kind of a, you know, uh, just a generic term, but basically don't cause harm to individuals um, and society itself. But uh, just think about this, what, you know, the systems could be hacked uh, through the, um, the learning and stealing of data and launch, launch a security attack. Uh, the other thing too is uh, something that Corey was talking about alluding to earlier where, um, how about the self-driving cars, right? Um, if there's nothing programmed in there correctly, um, it's not doesn't learn the right information. It can cause seriously serious harm where it can't distinguish between one thing or another and possibly crash into pedestrians. Well, that would be a, a big problem. Also, the other side uh, thing that stands out right now is discrimination. You know, uh, the term bias has been used quite a bit uh, within this panel discussion right here. But, uh, you know, there's certain groups that can be um, uh, biased against. Um, due to the fact that uh, what it's learned and how it's how how it's gained, gathered the data, um, so that could be you know people uh, of color or or women could be biased based upon the the things that it's long uh, learned uh, through the internet. And we all know that with AI right now, it's limited to only go back a certain number of years, right? It doesn't go back to the beginning of time. So there's a, a limitation of of knowledge really that it's hasn't been totally turned loose yet, uh, which is Kind of scary frankly um also violation of privacy tracking of people i mean we have that to some extent right now uh just with the general internet and and things that are out there but uh um the efficiencies of of ai makes makes it much more um adaptable uh to do things like that uh to track information to gather information to gather data to uh to use and um, those things and also the last thing that really stood out for me was the uh loss of control um, you know, making decisions on health and finance, specifically health, right? You've got um, these um, these algorithms that are being used to, to make decisions, but I would make a point here is that I think AI is a great tool. Um, there's some pros and cons, but if you don't use the thing between the two ears in your head um, to analyze the information, it's, it's, uh, it, could, it could be turned into a, a really bad situation, specifically in the, in the medical field. So, I mean, what are the areas? So with knowing that, what are some of the things that, how could you uh, fix that? I and mean, I'll just go briefly in that basically design uh, with safety and security in mind, like anything else, like you do programming, right? And implement security measures, firewalls, things like that. So you limit the access itself, uh, be transparent. I know we talked a little bit about that already and also uh, account for potential bias in the systems uh, and be accountable because you're gonna, it's gonna be wrong. I mean, it's always, there's going to be points along the way that the systems are always going to need some checking. Uh, you need some fail safes uh, to be put in place uh, for some really serious things, you know, military, if you want to consider that. But um, those are the things that, you know, some of the steps that developers can take uh, to ensure that these uh, safeguards are in place. Now, the next thing that, that really stands out is regulations. And then that's a complex issue. And I know, I believe Justin's gonna get into that. So I won't, I won't dive into that, but uh, maybe Justin could um, uh, provide some information regarding the, you know, where the regulations stand today and what we might wanna consider. Thanks very much, George. Yeah, let, let's do that. And in fact, let's go, go back to trust models in, in general and in the, in the bigger picture. We have so many different kinds of entities that can be part of a real-time distributed system. And we just heard actually several really excellent uh, talks and panels about our energy systems, uh, which have, are very, very complex, have lots of different uh, entities within them, and more and more new entities. And we've got the old so-called OT systems that are, want to be merged into the newer IT systems. And um, they have this pipeline of transmission, storage, distribution, transformation of energy. And we have all kinds of devices, local and global controllers. You can now control so much just from a, 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 a mobile phone now. They, they, you can control, uh, in fact, I love the title of, uh, of um, Bruce Schneier's book, Click Here to Destroy the World. Uh, you, I mean, it's all connected, so it's, it's, it's possible. 
so the problem uh, also is, is that interactions among a lot of these entities are op are, uh, want to be optimized for profit, but by, for different people's profit mm -hmm. and uh, for di the different per uh, participants. And that means certain kinds of conflict that are going to cry out for policy making and regulation. And, and what's your point of view of that? Yeah, so I, I, think, um, I think regulation is going to be really big. And, and to your point uh, about the energy space, so I used to work in energy space for a little bit. And just the amount of technology that they put into a small circuit breaker was just mind blowing to me, right? Um, but kind of going back to regulation, I think uh, what's going to be key is uh, having individuals from these specific industries like IoT that can add that expertise. And the reason why is because I think IoT is so unique um, purely based off of the speed, right? The speed of data, it's near real time, the amount of data that's coming in, um, the interoperability, you know, that term's been thrown around a lot as part of this, uh, this conference. And so I think regulation is really going to have to have some specific nuances for each individual space. And so I know uh, in Singapore specifically, they started this, this idea of creating a, a sandbox, if you will, that is focused on a particular industry. Um, and they've had some success with the, the fintech space and some success with the healthcare space, um, I think back in 2018. But um, really the whole thought process behind this was having the 11 principles that are outlined in things like the EU acts, having that baked into this environment where you can actually deploy your models, deploy uh, whatever systems you want into this particular controlled environment and see how it holds up in those, in those particular guidelines. And so I think things like that, things like having individuals come in and add that specific expertise, I think is going to be very important because most people don't realize it, but think about how often you walk into a new building and just connect to the new Wi-Fi, right? From a liability perspective, if something goes wrong, Apple made the iPhone, Verizon made the service, the Spectrum gave you the, you know, the internet, the Wi-Fi, right? So who's responsible? That's right. Um, so I think those type of questions are going to have to come up and are going to drive a lot of the regulation, which um, I know some people kind of feel like, you know, we need reg regulation right now, but I think it's very important for us to spend some time, get it right. That way we can have some confidence in, you know, the direction we're ultimately hoping to go. So I'd like to follow up a little bit there and that, uh, I, I, again, I, I love the panel you were on er, earlier and uh, what came, in, came to my mind as a sort of a follow-up to the efforts that people are making in, here at SAS and other places into the development of, uh, of uh, AI models is accountability. Yeah. Yeah, you've got, you know, you're working on trustworthiness, and, and I like to distinguish that between uh, trustworthy and trusted. I mean, trusted really means you're relying on, on something, mm -hmm. okay? May not be trustworthy, right. <laughs> but you're relying on it. It's a synonym for, 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 for re reliance. Um, what are going to be standards of ac uh, accountability? And, you know, we heard about best practices also on, right. on the panel. And best practices are something that uh, sometimes have a legal uh, 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 meaning to. You know, if you're not deploying best practices and something goes wrong, you're probably more uh, uh, more liable for if things, uh, when things go wrong. So, um, how is accountability, actually everybody can answer this, how, how is accountability uh, starting to come into the uh, AI world and to the IoT world in general? Yeah, I think um, my, my initial thought is that everybody's going to, you know, put their finger to their nose and say, not it, right? I don't want to be accountable for it. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of the, the big players, right, the Microsofts of the world, are starting to kind of be in these, these high-level conversations with government um, because they want to drive that decision, right? Because if you drive the decision, you're a little bit more willing to be, you know, to be held accountable because you know that you kind of built those rules, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think really um, once we actually start to build these, I know we have NIST and I know we have other organizations, once we have this kind of conglomerate as a whole that kind of sits at the top that says, all right, these are going to be the guidelines and then have subdivisions to, to talk to specific industries. I think I have no timeline for you, 
But I think once that actually happens, I think then you'll start to see the actual accountability start to come into play. But as it stands right now, I think each individual company are building their own guidelines and, and we have some frameworks in place. Um, like for instance, marking sensitive variables, marking uh, variables for bias, model interpretability. Uh, we have those kind of uniform um, metrics that we you know, use from a modeling perspective. But I think overall, it'll be some time before we really have true accountability from a legal perspective. Yeah, I actually like to follow up on that point a little bit with, with Corey, uh, as again, t taking the developer point of view, and in particular in your organization, Corey, you uh, use uh, and, and promulgate a lot of uh, open source software. Uh, and uh, that's just been a revolution for, for, for all of us over the past few decades. But it's open source, and how does accountability work there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for any of you that aren't familiar with Red Hat, at its core, culturally and business-wise, open source is its focus. Uh, so accountability around, uh, I, I'm not a legal counsel, so I can't go into all the different licensing. It gets complicated, but the idea is that there's a community around contributing to the software. And most, like, if we're talking AI, machine learning, data science, all of those tools there's no way you're going to work in that ecosystem without touching something that's open source because at, at the core at the foundation is a lot of open source technologies released by industry leaders like google and and others that that are trying to allow ai to be consumable by the masses and um as far as accountability goes in general speaking with open source it's the benefit of open source in this in this area is the fact of explainability. If we have proprietary software building machine models, it's a lot harder to explain why this model is doing what we see it doing. Um, like if it's behaving in a way that's against cultural norms or appears like like in the example before where it's lying to us because it has hallucinations, like we need to know and having that open source, you can look at it and explain why that's happening. Um, and so at the heart of all of this, I, I see open source expanding, at least in this area, or maintaining its presence as a foundational uh, tool. Cool. Any of you guys have uh, questions you want to bring up? Well, uh, so I'd like to uh, comment. Uh, you know, we were talking about policy, uh, governments, oversight, um, and compliance, right? which are very important. And I, you know, certainly. Uh, subscribe to those concepts, but I think that those are antiquated. Um, I think this needs to be a dual, if not you know, triple, I don't know the third dimension yet because I don't think it's been in, invented, but it will soon. But I do think it needs to be a dual approach. I think from the outside in, policy, government, rules, regulations, all need to be uh, set and understood. Right? But certainly the hackers are gonna blow that off, right? So that's not gonna work for them anyway. And of course, the advancement of software Software is eating the world. That's a term that's been used for a long time, probably cliche at this point, but it's true. Who's going to, like, is our current, well, is the guy in the White House going to say, oh, don't do that, AI engine? And the person's going to say, yes, that, that's not going to happen, right? So let, let's, let's understand this. I think from the inside out also, so we look at things like self sovereign identity or decentralized identity. For example, an open standard that is evolved and is slowly being adopted, right? Becoming the verifiable credential. It's a software uh, credential, right? It's like having a, a driver's license, right? But it puts the uh, owner, whether it's a human or a machine or a piece of code, right? Uh, at the center of the identity attributes, right? It's immutable, it's identified, it's accepted, and it operates under what's called a PKI or public key infrastructure. Right, that will be open and transparent, perhaps even an open source version of that, uh, therefore the Linux Foundation uh, open wallet movement. Um, I think that that needs to happen because without fixing the identity issue, we're open to fraud, misuse, data uh, manipulation. I mean, there are companies, multi, multi-billion dollar companies today that are growing meteorically. In fact, actually just recently an article about the biggest company in the world Right, uh, being a healthcare company, not to mention who they are, but all they do is basically take our health information, you know, 
and use it for their benefit, right? They sell it to pharmaceutical organizations looking for patterns of disease efficacies and so on. And they're, I mean, that, it's, that's got to stop, right? Because it's going to actually increase now, in my professional opinion, and we could, we could debate this because there's a lot of intelligent and experienced people here uh, on this, uh, in this group. Um, uh, but uh, with the, uh, the access and, the, again, the availability of, uh, of you know, generative AI. Um, so uh, I think uh, the ability to authenticate, to verify the who, right, to authenticate the data, to authenticate the AI engine, of course, then behind that, the transparency of the engine, as was addressed in the panel earlier, uh, does the AI engine do what it says it's supposed to do? Can I depend on that? Is it trustworthy, to use Dave's words? Okay, fine. Now, is that the AI engine I'm actually interacting with? That's, a, that's the other part of the equation. Right? Um, so I think the emergence of the, uh, the decentralized identity, I think, is going to take, uh, take hold. Um, I think it's going to uh, find a home, perhaps healthcare. HIPAA, the supposed policy that was developed in 1996, pre-internet era, um, you know, is still in place today. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the example of the healthcare organizations that use other people's data uh, for you know, uh, profit and gain. Um, so let's find the reason. Let's find the case study. The IoT community should draw together and let's make referenceable advancements where people are still improving, you know, EBITDA CAGR, right? So we're still com compound annually growing our profits, yet we're still protecting and preserving um, uh, identity, uh, people's, uh, people's personal information, uh, and other things that we hold true, uh, you know, as we currently exist as a human society. I would make the case that you could have um, multiple things in parallel working at the same time with, you know, not only the, the distributed identity, but also in the regulation field, I think there is a need for regulation to some extent, but at the same time on the opposite side of that, that really hinders uh, innovation. So you have to be really careful about, you know, tamping down, um, putting too much regulation in place where the innovation aspect of, of AI is, is, is squashed. So that's something. And then getting back to Corey's statement about open source, I would make the case that open source is more secure than uh, proprietary solutions because you have more of a um, sampling, you know, of individuals that are looking at it. And when you lock it down and, and you control of control releases, I think that's the, the better model to go about it anyway. And I think the, um, the horse has left the barn in regards to AI and the fact that uh, it's out there and it's going to even grow even faster and further with other organizations. Right now we're talking about, you know, ChatGPT and Bard and there's others right, LLMs that are out there, right? Um, I think it's just a matter of fine tuning. And I think it's gonna take a, this is going to be one of those discovery periods and it's gonna be painful. Um, there's gonna be good and there's gonna be a lot of bad, um, but I think there needs to be uh, some regulations to some extent. And the other thing that I noticed that it, and when we're talking today is that we're mainly concentrating on national US vision I think there's a more uh, a better position for this from a international standpoint where you bring it up because you're going to be crossing barriers. And um, so that's just something that we should keep in mind that we're not just a national AI is just not national. It's 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 global. So you have to keep that in mind. And I think I'll um, chime in, too, from the data side. I mean, we see it globally with the different data privacy issues and regulations in different countries. Mm -hmm. um, we have it here sometimes in the States. California is a lot different mm -hmm. than some of the other ones. And I think it's interesting because we're seeing a lot of the not it's going on right now in financial services. And it's kind of coming back around where, you know, it's it's hard being an organization just using financial services as an example where, um, you know, they're trying to protect their customers. They're trying to put all these data privacy um, things in place, the authentication, making sure you know where you are. So then there's the fine line between, you know, do I want my information out there? Do I not want my information out there? Some people feel like they want it. Some people feel like they don't, and they're kind of in the middle. Well, what happens if you don't have that? It becomes hard to authenticate you between all these devices that we're using to make payments, to log into things, I mean, to get into your car, to get into your house. And um, what we're finding is more and more fraud is coming through and more and more identities are being breached. But what's happening is because consumers are being given the option to 
opt out of, of double authentication, opt out, oh, well, I, my cookies are fine, I'm great, you know, accept it, let's just move on, because again, they want fast, they want convenient, they want to get in and what they want. Now we're starting to see organizations take a step back and say, well, wait a second, we gave you the option to double authenticate, we gave you the option to clear your cookies, and is that really our fault that your account was breached or is it your fault? So there's a lot of regulation and discussions going on right now around that because we're kind of just starting to see it, you know, take a turn. Yeah. Because who who really is being held accountable for, you know, your identity right. being stolen? Yeah, so. it's a transfer of liability is basically yeah. what companies are trying to do, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we need to see wallets, you know, the digital wallet, which is which are exploding, by the way, they're growing faster than credit card <laughs> issuance. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis per unit. Um, I think the Web3 wallets are great, right? The payment wallets, Apple and so on. And, you know, I think the sideshow that is crypto, um, you know, coins, NFTs, and pictures of monkeys and stuff, that's gonna go away. I guess they're calling it Web5, call it whatever you want, but the new addition of the wallet becomes the infrastructure, the mechanism, if you will, to be smart with regards to identity information, to preserve your privacy, but still interact to opt in or opt out intelligently. Just like you set your iOS parameters, pretty simply the wallets of the future, when I'm talking about a year or two, that's the future these days, pretty soon it'll be a week, um, you know, will we'll help us to have much more control, if you will, as humans. And of course, as we start to deploy machines and software and engines themselves, you know, uh, in autonomous AI and, uh, scenarios networked, um, you know, you're gonna have these smart, a credential sharing and adjudication, if you will, computationally, where governance is already set, right? And the certificates match, you know, public key matching and so on, um, and the transaction closes or the interaction closes. If a social interaction, I'm making sure I'm speaking with Dave, I'm making sure I'm speaking to the right person when I'm interacting, whether it's Twitter or whatever, you know, today you could be talking to somebody else and not know it, right? What's the old cartoon? It's been around for a bazillion years of the of the dog, you know, on the computer and saying, you know, these days they don't know, people don't know who you are on the internet and the, the dog's typing on the computer, right? So, I mean, that's a little bit out there, but the point I'm trying to make is, I think we all need to understand that the credentials that we use today need to evolve very rapidly. If we're all going to survive, to press the button to kill the world or whatever, that's scary. And it is, you know, they're talking about the advancements of AI being, might be a little bit hyperbolic, but you know, worse than nuclear war. I mean, it's, you know, if you think about it, there have been movies made for it, especially in the 50s. Um, so anyway. So um, they sort of get back to the, the, the notion of trust. We've talked about, uh, okay, we can get, uh, we can authenticate people, we can authenticate uh, AI uh, agents, we can, uh, vet them, we can give them credentials and all of that. Uh, but uh, the decisions are still made on machines very often that are uh, multi-purpose machines that do all kinds of crazy things. And there is a growing notion of a devastating attack on those machines called, uh, well, they're different things are called, but they're called, I think most appropriately called pre-authentication remote code execution. In other words, uh, attacks, for example, on your phone where you don't have to click on anything. They just come into your phone and the phone ha executes so many instructions before you get the authentication that it has the wonderful opportunity to take over that device. And it has been, these things are now f found in the wild. Does any, I mean, I, I asked this of all kinds of people, and you know, so I'm just bringing it up here as uh, do we envision that in the IoT world, we're gonna go back to not multi-purpose devices. I need something to open the floodgates on this mm -hmm. dam. It doesn't need to, to check its email before it does that. Uh, so do we see any evolution in that direction? Uh, George or, or Corey or anybody here? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, and the reason why is because you have people like Elon Musk that are trying to make you know, Twitter be, you know, the everything app, right? Mm -hmm. X. 
Um, and so I think from just purely an innovation perspective and purely from a convenience perspective as well, like people want everything in one nice, convenient place. Um, and as you mentioned, right, there's a lot of gaps there, there's a lot of vulnerabilities there, but I think all in all, we're going to have to innovate the data authentication piece of it just as fast as we're innovating the actual product and feature aspect of it. Um, because if we don't, it'll continuously outpace the, the actual security piece and it'll always end up being you know, something, something negative, right? And then you think about things that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Ring, I think, might be one of the most hacked uh, security <laughs> systems, right? But it's convenient, mm -hmm. right? You, you move into a house and Ring automatically comes with your house. Well, they make it so convenient to put a nice little Ring camera on your door. They make it convenient to put it up, uh, put a nice camera up on the side of your house or you know above your garage or whatever, right? Um, so why wouldn't I get a Ring, mm -hmm. especially if all of these other big bigger, more quote unquote secure security uh, companies are uh, more expensive. Um, so I think it comes back to convenience and unless we're willing to kind of hold off on convenience for a little bit, I think we're gonna to have to start having more innovation from a data, a data authentication perspective. So somebody's gonna make a lot of money in the future. <laughs> <laughs> And I would, I'd plus one that comment because it's really up to us how much control we want to give these yeah. things. And I think you're right. Like we love being comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so if we if we trade the risks for comfort, yeah, that's that's what we're going to have to watch out for. At, at the same time, also, um, like we, we have the ability to have a lot of benefits as well. And and I think we just need to we need to remember that. AI is supposed to supplement or, or help augment what we do um, because I want my value system applied. I don't want a machine to do that. And like I value life and a machine doesn't. And I value like helping the disadvantaged and a machine won't know that. So I want to be augmented in my choices, not let autonomy do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I would say trust, security, you know, it's one of those things where it's like insurance, right? Nobody likes to pay for insurance for the house or their cars until you need it. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing with data and losing your data and identity theft. Uh, once it happens, it's a it's a nightmare, of course, and you wish you had the safeguards in place. And um, Right now, we're seeing an awful lot of um, products coming out regarding um, not using passwords, passwordless systems that are in place. You, know, you even have key storage, right, that's been around for years, mm -hmm. right? And what's the, the first place that attackers want to go after? Well, if you can get that, Right, then you have the keys to the kingdom. So um, I, right now, I think it's a matter of we're kind of in the beginning stages and there's things that we just don't know that are coming down the road and uh, that are gonna you know, open up. And I think the blend of efficiency and security um, and comfort, um, I mean, they, they go hand in hand, right? Um, so I, I would say this, it's just like insurance where nobody likes to pay for it, but you certainly like the benefits of it when it happens to you. So. I, I think that those uh, sentiments uh, a good closing because that's these are the facts and uh, I think that uh, you know we're uh, in, in the security world sometimes chicken littles uh, and um, we're paid to be that way sometimes and uh, on the other hand uh, we've got to just live with the uh, reality and there's always going to be this, this that kind of tension but the IoT world really, really, really is different. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to keep on having this, this, these discussions. And it was great to be with you guys today, George and, and Corey, uh, uh, remotely. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Take care.